Amen. Uh, this morning, we placed these particular uh, booklets on your chair, and we place them every other one. But if you need one of these, if you didn't get one of these, there are some in the foyers at guest services and out on the glass table, or maybe there's one laying around next to you that, that no one has claimed, but we have extras for you. And we wanted to put this in your hand as we are beginning 2018 because we want you to understand and know what Living Free Fellowship is all about. This is the foundation that we are building upon. And today we've entitled Vision Sunday. Now I'm not going to be preaching from this little book. This book is just the foundation. It has our scriptures. It has direction uh, for where we're going and what we're trying to accomplish. But at the end of the day... Um, we're asking you to begin to, to invest yourselves into fulfilling that particular vision and mission today. So, uh, as, we, as we think back over the past two Sundays, over the past two Sundays, we've been looking at two different parables. One of those parables was found in Luke chapter 16, and one of those parables is found in Luke chapter 19. Understanding what it means to be faithful in the little things. If you have not seen those messages or listened to those messages, uh, those are on Facebook, our Facebook page. You can check those out. Go back and follow up with that. But when we, when, we, when we start thinking about those particular messages, starting with stewarding our lives out of, out of Luke chapter 16, and second, by managing the gifts that He has given, we're seeing what God is asking of us as His people. Because how many understand that each and every one of us have a responsibility placed up on us? Grace is free. Amen? Grace has been given to us free, but grace will cost you something. I got a couple. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Grace will cost you something. It's letting go of who you used to be for the sake of being who God's called you to be. Amen? It's about letting go of your old life, that old nature, and taking on the new nature that is found in Christ. And as the New Testament says, we take off the old, the old garment and we put on the new garment. God doesn't do that for you. You have to be willing to take off all of the old things that you used to be because He's not going to force your hand. He's not going to force your mouth. He's not going to force your thoughts. He will provide you what you have need with so that you can move your hand and your mouth and control your thoughts. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 that we take everything captive and make it obedient to Christ. That means we take it captive. So there's a responsibility that falls to us to steward the life that God has given us under the great grace of God. There's a responsibility that's there for you and I to do every day. Well, when it comes to stewardship, if I never take responsibility for me under the grace that God has given, how do I expect and how do you expect to steward the great things of God that He longs for me to have and longs for you to have? Well, one thing I can't and I won't. And God has placed gifts in my life as we look at Luke 19, as well as your life, gifts to be used for the advancement of His kingdom. I have two options in my life. And I believe you have those same two options. We can invest those gifts in acts of service, or we can take those gifts and tuck them away and never use them for kingdom purposes. That's what Luke 19 teaches us. We can take those gifts and begin to invest them into the kingdom of God, the gifts that God has given, because if you remember the parable, Jesus said that when the, when the servant came back to his master, he said, Master, your minna has made. It wasn't, my mena, I have done this. No, your mena has made through the investment that we make into the kingdom of God. So all of the gifts that we have this morning is because the Lord has placed them into our lives. And we invest them. Two options. We can invest them. Or we can tuck them away like the servant did by placing it in a handkerchief and putting it away. You see, for me to find meaning and purpose in my life, I have to be willing to steward those moments. You have to be willing to steward those moments, faithful in the little things, only to find the much that God wants to give to you. 
So I so appreciate these types of teachings uh, from Jesus. Why? Because Jesus brings about clarity. He brings about an understanding to an otherwise scattered life that we have. And He brings clarity to this Christian walk that we live. Would you agree with that? I need to know what He's asking of me after salvation. I need to know what He wants me to do. And believe me when I say that the Scripture is full of what He wants us to do following salvation. How we live, how we act, how we speak. All of those things come into play. He brings clarity to those moments. He brings teaching to those moments. So that we can know the next step for our lives. You see, He's helped me. And He helps you to know and understand where to start. And how to continue and what the result will be. Bringing clarity. I heard a story this week of a person who was getting his concealed gun permit. Or he received it. And this, this may or may not be true. So uh, I can't confirm or deny. So there you have it. Um, but he got, his, he got his concealed carry permit. And he went down to the local Bass Pro shop. And he found him this sweet little 9 millimeter. Bought all the little accessories for it. Got his holster. The whole thing. And when he got ready to, prep, uh, to pay, the, the, the cashier said, Strip down facing me. Not fully understanding why the cashier would say that. Maybe it's because of all of the gun control that's been going on. He did as he was instructed. And when the shock of what happened began to cease... He came to realize that the cashier was referring to how he should place his credit card in the card reader, stripped down, facing me. Needless to say, <laughs> needless to say, he was asked to shop somewhere else. How many understand that there needed to be some clarity in that moment? Stripped down, facing me. There needed to be some clarity. Well, when we think about it, that's life. Who and what we've been created for can at times be lost in all of the noise that is around us. You see, that's why Jesus went out of His way to teach His disciples. That's why He went out of His way to give us instruction today. So that we would understand whose we are and what we've been created for. For, so as to get the most out of the life that we have as we prepare for the next. But we must be willing to steward that moment. As we talked about for the last couple of weeks. We need to steward that moment. So this morning, we've called this Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday. I'm not asking you to deviate from that, uh, from that line of thinking. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not here today to talk to you about a man's plan for our lives in the sense that I want you to do what I'm asking of you. I'm pointing you to the Word of God and what the clarity that Jesus brings to our life. That's the thought pattern that I want you to keep. What is Jesus saying to me and what kind of clarity does He bring to my life as a child of God? You see, I've been asking God to give us simple direction, vision, if you will, according to His instructions so that we as a church may respond in the little things knowing that it produces so much more not only in our lives but also in the lives of those who are around us that we interact with every single day. You see, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Now, unrestrained carries the meaning of being wild or carries the meaning of being uh, uncontrolled. And for some, we may like that particular spirit about us, but when in reality, it has no direction. It has no purpose for its strength that it has. Everybody following me? When we're unrestrained, we have, we have no source of direction or purpose. You know, when I was younger, my dad traded and owned horses, much like his father. And one of those horses that we had growing up was a Mustang from out west. 
For those who have ever been around Mustangs out west, they are beautiful creatures. They're strong creatures. They can run like no one's business. They, they, they're just majestic to watch. But when you think about a Mustang in captivity, he was not the easiest thing to be around. Uh, we rode him from time to time, and we worked with him as much as we could, yet he was never a horse that was considered to be safe. I don't think I can, that if I, as I look back, I can't ever imagine or remembering riding him. Uh, my brother did, my dad did, but he was, he, it was a horse that was just very temperamental. He was, he was very wild in nature, and I would even go as far as to say as being dangerous. Because I can remember a time we were out back around the stables, and dad was doing something. He had him on a lead rope attached to the bridle. And all of a sudden, something just got in his uh, craw. Uh, that's a southern term, if you don't know what that means. It, uh, he got in his craw, and all of a sudden, he just raised up on my dad. Like Lone Ranger, high ho silver type stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm standing there watching it as a small kid, and I see him go up in the air, and he's pawing like he's trying to strike my dad. As he was, as, and dad leaned back away from him, had the very end of the lead rope, and pulled him back down and got him under control. You see, he had strength, he had speed, he had all the things that were working for him, but it didn't serve him well because this horse really wasn't tame. It wasn't being used to its full potential. You see, when we're unrestrained, we never become tame to the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hear what I'm saying? When we're unrestrained, we never allow Jesus... Our owner, because you've been bought with a price, correct? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tells us that. We've been bought with a price. Jesus, our owner, we, we never allow Jesus to have control because we find ourselves living in unrestraint. You see, vision points us in a direction. Vision brings clarity to our moments. Vision brings uh, restraint under the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives, helping us to become fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. It's my intent this morning to give us direction on the authority of God's Word and asking you to live on purpose, to live on purpose with meaning, together as His church, being faithful in the little so as to steward the greater. So I'm asking you a question. Are, are you with me? Are you with me? We're going to talk about that today. You see, the early church... The early church displayed five functions, Acts chapter 2. I want to encourage you to go back. I'm not going to take the time to read that, but you can read the whole chapter. Acts chapter 2, they, they, did, they displayed five functions. Worship to God, discipleship through what they were taught, fellowship with one another, ministry through their unique gifts, and evangelism to those who have yet, who have yet come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. The result being Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47 when it says, And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Jesus told us in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, right before the second parable that we discussed last week, Luke chapter 19, right before He told that story, He made these comments, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. That's what He came to do. That's what His purpose was. That was His end goal. And if it was Jesus' end goal, as well as we see the disciples in Acts chapter 2, we're seeing people being added to the church as many who are being saved, then that means to, for us today that we, if we're going to be people who are outward aimed, then everything that we do in these 90 or so minutes as we gather here in this room, and everything that we do in a Bible study, and everything we do in an altar of prayer, every encouragement we give to one another as the body of Christ, is all for the purpose of being able to present this adequate presentation of the gospel to the people that we encounter every single day. Leading them to a place of knowing Jesus and experiencing the salvation that He brings to their lives. That's why we exist. That's why we are here as children of God. That we allow these particular functions to operate in us as believers. Leading to result. Leading to a place of being outward aimed. Because the church has a mission. And we're all called to live and follow and fulfill that mission. 
So I'm convinced this morning to be a people who are outward aim and presenting a Christ-centered message, then we must follow the lead of the early church, the early disciples in their functions. Not only does it produce this prayer-driven, spirit-empowered, Bible-based, growth-minded people, which would be us, it will cause us also to be people-focused. I'll let that sink in. It will cause us to be people-focused. How many churches are self-absorbed? How many churches are, are inward focused? How many of us are, are, as long as my needs are being met, as long as I'm getting what I've come to do or come to receive, and then I'm going to go out and do what I want to do? No, that's not what we're about as the people of God. Once again, Jesus brings clarity to our lives and shows us what we do on this side of salvation as the people of God. So therefore, we are outward Aimed, And we become people focused, not just within our four walls, which is important, but mindful for all people. God placing in our hearts this passion to share the good news of the gospel with those who are around us. Achieving our vision to love God and to love others and to serve God and to serve others and to grow and help others grow in that process. So as we're positioning ourselves in the new year, for personal growth, and for service. And as it becomes our desire to accomplish our vision and our mission as Living Free Fellowship, as I said in the beginning, I desire for God to give us a simple direction. I'm just, I like simple things, amen? I like simple things that we can attach ourselves to, but those simple things bring clarity to our spiritual journey as to how, how. A journey where our basics continue to perpetuate the examples of the disciples causing us to love, serve, and grow. So as we move into 2018, I submit to you three steps that will, that will not only begin your journey to being outward aim, which is our end result, but will also perpetuate that journey for years to come as being fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you is the three things that I'm giving you today is going to, it's not we do them this year. It's something that we continue to perform in our lives, which allows to perpetuate our journey, perpetuate our faith, and causes us to be outward aimed as people. Seeing souls come to Jesus. Still with me? Well, let's start. Here's the first one. Every person attend a worship service. Every person attend a worship service. Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse number 37. He said to him, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, all of us are very familiar with this, 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 this passage of Scripture. It's known as the great commandment. Therefore, it is our mission to live out the great commandment. And that will happen in the context of our daily walk before God, but also through our ability to be a part of the body of Christ. Amen? Being a part of the body of Christ. You see, the church was established by Jesus. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is the one who established the body. He's the one who established the church. And there's a reason why the church does life together. When you think about Paul and his ministry, we're going to come to this a little bit later as well, but when you think about Paul, he was continually ministering to the churches. He was continuing writing letters to the churches, offering instruction and direction so that they can fulfill what God had called them to do. So there's a, there's a reason why we come together. There's a reason why the body of Christ has been established by Him. For one, we come together to, the, to be in the presence of God. Amen? You see, we show love to the one who first loved us with heart and with soul and with our mind. We're not here. When you walk in the doors of this church, I want to encourage you to kind of forget about what the lunch plans are. I want you to forget about what tomorrow is. And sometimes that can be very difficult because our brains don't shut off. But there's a reason why we come together. And when we come together and we enter this building, there is an opportunity for us to come into the very presence of the Almighty together. 
Together worshiping the King. Together honoring the Lord Jesus for what He has done in our lives. How many know God's presence can do more in your life than a lifetime of counseling? Just in that moment of time, God can bring clarity and understanding to your situation and to where you are and bring comfort and peace into your life so rapidly than weeks and months and years working it out with some counselor somewhere. You see, that's why when we come into this place, we sing a new song to the Lord. That's why we find a place in the altar just to, just to, 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 to solidify the things that we're hearing in our lives. And if, and if there's a need in our hearts that we just need to present to, to someone, we have folks gathering around us once again, as the scripture says, bringing encouragement to the body. We're lifting up the name of Jesus. We seek His presence. And it should be our desire to love Him in that moment. To love Him, undistracted devotion to the Lord, the Scripture says. But second, we come together to encourage one another. We offer love because we're known as His disciples by the love that we have for one another. Paul, in Romans chapter 1, let me give you this story. Uh, Verses 11 and 12. He spoke to the relationship of the body. To the body. He says this, For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. That you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you. Each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. You see, Paul, what he was saying is, I want to come to church and I want to preach. Most preachers do, right? Right? We want to come to church and we want to preach. Amen, Joel? You're the only one with me. Amen. Um, We want to... (laughs) We want to come to church and we want to preach. We want to share what the Lord has laid. We want to impart some gift that God has placed in our spirit to you. But he also referenced in verse 12 of what the church does for him. Not only did he desire to be a benefit to the church as a preacher, but he said that the body was a benefit to him. That I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Do you see what he's saying to us? Do you see the impact that this preacher, this pastor is saying to the church of Rome? That designated group that was meeting there in that city, wherever that happened to be at that time? He said, I'm wanting to come to you and I'm wanting to impart this wonderful gift that the Lord has placed to you. You will have growth, that you will have discipleship, that you would would increase in your faith and in your walk with God. But I also desire to be there for what reason? Because you encourage me. Church, you're a gift to me. Every week, I, I, I stand humbled on this platform that all of you would be willing to come and listen to me or Tim or, or, or Joel or, or Ty or anyone else, Pastor Daryl, as we stand and minister the Word of God. We consider that a privilege. You are a gift to us. And together, our faith encourages one another. Our faith builds one another up. Because when you give a smile or you give an encouraging word, when you come with the right intent into the house of God, you're here for a purpose. We're not here just wasting an hour and a half. And if you are, and if you feel that way, then you need to reevaluate starting first with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you are a part of the body of Christ. The the body that He has established. And we're allowed, we've been granted the privilege to come together at this preaching point, in this place, at 233 Riggs Avenue. To worship and honor the King and to bless one another together. You want to see fulfillment in your life? Then commit to your worship service. Commit to the body of Christ that you have called your home. Because in that in itself perpetuates your journey of faith. As you have I don't want to live out there by myself. I don't want to be an island unto myself. We were never called to be that. I need you in my life. I need you. I need to be able to say, hey, pray for me. I need you to begin to invest in my life. I have many of you that give me scriptures. You'll text me scriptures. You'll speak, hey, pastor, I got a word for you today. I visited someone in the hospital 
They were sedated and about to go under for surgery. And he said to me, Pastor, I got a word for you. (laughs) And as I was laying there praying for him, he shared with me, and I started crying in in, in in the holding room as he was slowly fading away. And I walked out being more ministered unto than what I probably, he was more of a gift to me than I was probably to him that day. Do you see the power of the body of Christ when we come together in a a worship service and we love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and we love our neighbor as ourselves? What we're doing is we're fulfilling godly moments. We're fulfilling things that build your faith and perpetuate your journey. We love God and we love others. Second, today, every person connect to a small group. Now, let me just give you a, I don't want to give too much away, but we're going to, next week is Small Group Sunday. And in 2018, we're launching something entirely different. If you're not here next week, you're going to miss it. But this is what we're talking about. Every person connected to a small group. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus tells us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This passage is known as the Great Commission. Therefore, it is our mission our mission to fulfill the Great Commission. You see, let me say this. We do life in groups. Do you believe that? We do life in groups. I want you to think about it. When you go to a concert, let's just say any concert, many times there are thousands of people who are in those stands. Do you know all those individuals? But you're at the concert. You should know everybody because you're there with them, right? No. You, you don't know probably people three down from you. You're there in a group. You're there in a smaller group in the whole. When you go out to eat at a restaurant, there's not a community table for every person. Most of the time there are tables of four and tables of six and tables of eight. And your party joins the entire party and you enjoy each other's company. Whether it be your family or whether it be extended friends, you are in a group in the midst of the whole. Even your friendships, though they can be comprised really of many people, there's a smaller group that you do life with. Why? The ability to connect for one. There's a connecting point, a place where you know certain individuals, people that you uh, enjoy being around. You're able to be accountable to them. You're able to have a relationship with them. We call that fellowship, but also the ability to process information. We call that discipleship. To be able to process. If you were in a, a, a concert with thousands of people, are you able to comprehend all the conversations that are being taken place in that room? No, not even in a restaurant. Bring it down to 55 people. You can, only, you can only contain the conversations that are happening in your group. And that's the, empower, that's, the, that's the power of a small group. My wife is a teacher. She has anywhere from 18 to 25 students in her classes throughout the day. And it's a well-known fact that the larger the group, the lower the engagement. Right? How many parents in the room? How many parents in the room, you said you fought that fight of making sure that classrooms are smaller, more so than larger. Because we understand that larger classrooms where the teachers have to deal not only with uh, bad attitude Johnny, but also we have to deal with smart kid Sarah. You know, we're trying to balance all of those moments. And what happens is the whole class begins to suffer because we can't give attention to everybody's needs. So we as parents, what we have done is we have worked hard, went to our school boards, and we say we want smaller classrooms. Sometimes that's hard to do, but yet it's still a desire because we know that in a smaller classroom, it creates this greater sense of learning. That's why parents push for it. That's why we like it. 
That's why we ask for it for our children because we know that they will be engaged. Students create relationships and they learn from each other because it's just a few in the class as well as the teacher engaging them. And in those settings, there's involvement. There's involvement with those kids and there's growth that happens. Grades start going up because they're getting it because they have the attention Well, when we think about a small group within the body of Christ, when we begin, there's some of you in here, I'll ask you, hey, have you talked to so-and-so? Who's that? They sit two seats behind you every single Sunday. (laughs) There's people in here that we still don't know fully. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay because we're all here for the same purpose. And eventually you will. But the power of a small group allows for us To not only create that connecting point, not only does it allow us to create accountability between that person and you, but it also creates the opportunity for growth in your life. Because as you come together to study the Word of God, or to share the things of God, to pray for one another, there's power in those moments. And your, 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 your particular life begins to accelerate. You begin to be lifted because of the Word of God in your life. When I meet, when I meet with uh, Alex, and Alex is holding me accountable to what we talked about last week in small group. When he calls me on the phone and says, hey, I required reading. I don't know if there would be required reading, but uh, did, did you read this week? Come prepared so you can, you can discuss the Word of God, that you can be engaged and you can be involved. You see, everything goes up. Doing life in groups create opportunity not only to connect with others, that accountability, but also it makes disciples. You see, Jesus didn't say go make Christians. Uh, Have you read that in the Bible? I I haven't read that in the Bible. He he didn't say go and make Christians. He said go and make disciples. What's, What's the best way to do that? Jesus had 12. See, Jesus modeled a very... Now, He spoke to thousands... Multitudes that gathered and he shared the message of the gospel. But he lived life with 12. And when you take those 12 minus 1, Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, the one who betrayed Jesus, they changed the world. Because they had spent time with him. And in the book of Acts, when you see them beginning to minister, what was the testimony that was given to the disciples? They had perceived them to have been with Jesus. Oh, come on, that's good. We come together as a group. We come together and begin to do life. We begin to talk about the things of God, holding each other accountable for those things in our lives. And all of a sudden, we begin to grow in our faith and our walk with God. And then when we begin to speak in our community, at our job, at our school, what happens is people perceive. Because really, it's not about making you famous. It's about making Him famous. His name being glorified in all the earth. And if we're not willing to do that, the question is, are you willing to create fellowship and discipleship in your life? Are you willing to connect on that level? Or, once again, just like we stay away from church, are we willing to stay away from something, a biblical function within Scripture? We want to avoid that for the sake, because it just, we don't like it. That's something you have to ask the Holy Spirit. May we seek opportunity to grow and help others grow. Which leads me to a third practical step on this journey. Every person join a team. What does that mean, Pastor? John. Chapter 13, starting verse number 14, Jesus says, If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Now this passage is what I call the great example. Therefore, it's our mission to follow the great example. Now many of you know the story in John chapter 13. Jesus had gathered His disciples together. They had come into Jerusalem. It was leading into His betrayal and crucifixion. And it was around that, that, that Passover dinner that Jesus got up from the table. He took a towel and a bowl of water and He began to walk around the table, kneeling down, taking the towel, girding it about Himself, and He began to wash His disciples' feet, serving them. Serving them. He was giving them His un 
divided attention by loving on them through service. He was teaching us to serve. Matthew 20 and verse 28 tells us He came not to be served, but to serve. So as we discover our God-given gifts, as we understand those very things that the Lord has placed in our lives, those things as we see in Luke chapter 19, it's not what you have necessarily to give, but it's what Jesus has placed in it. It's your men, O Lord. It's your manna that you have placed in my life. The gifts that, as you begin to discover those gifts that are from the Lord and the talents that He has given you, may we employ them to serve those who are seated around you today because Jesus served His disciples. The people that He did life with. The people that you may do life with in your small group. May you serve them. May you love them in that capacity by giving yourself to them. Considering them greater in your life than yourself. And if they're doing the same, there's a mutual respect and a growth all around. And may we use them to serve the lost through the gospel message. Because Jesus not only served His disciples, but He went to the cross and He served all mankind. Giving Himself on the cross for you and I. So therefore, it is our duty and our job to serve those who are lost outside our community. In our community, rather. Outside this church. That we may look to them and see that there is a need. Because when you begin to grow spiritually, and when you begin to see the things of God, because you're stewarding the little, and you begin to see the much that God is wanting to place in your life, all of a sudden people, lost people, becomes a very different. They look different in your eyes. Because you begin to see them through the eyes of Christ. Not through Don's eyes, or Sherry's eyes, or Robert's eyes, or Amy's eyes, or my eyes. But we're seeing it through Christ's eyes. Because we're beginning to see the Scripture come alive in us as we mature in the things of God. And we watch God work through us. Which brings us to our goal of being an outward aim people. The lost finding a Savior as we serve God and as we serve others. Three simple steps. That if we commit to and perpetuate and continue to allow them to be a part of our lives forever. As we walk this journey with Christ and as we commit to those areas, what happens is we begin to mature and grow in Christ. And not only do we find love and service and growth in us, but we also help to love others Grow, help others grow, and also serve others ourselves. So there is a receiving that comes to us, but there's also a giving that goes out of us because of what Christ is producing in us. You see, church, every journey begins somewhere. I hope your journey begins today at living through fellowship, committing to love and serve and grow as a people. Beginning through three simple steps, steps that if perpetuated through your life will lead to you living from meaning. And living from purpose in your life. So as we move forward into 2018. Will you help reach those who have yet to hear the gospel? Because if we're not about the lost in our community, in our world, in our peer groups. What are we doing? You've heard people say that. But seriously, what are we doing? If our, if our intentions, if everything that we are is not focused on the lost. That's what Jesus did and that's what His disciples did. And because they lived out those functions in their life, the church was being added to daily as many as those who were being saved. We have a wonderful opportunity in front of us. And that is to be the church in 2018. To begin to allow the biblical functions that we see in Scripture flow through our lives. And many times we ask questions, Pastor, what do you you want us to do? Well, I'm just trying to bring a simple vision to us. It's so much more complex than, than probably what I'm talking about because all of this is compiled in what I'm saying today. But I'm trying to make it simple in the fact that says, how can those biblical functions, how can clarity come to my life? Commit to a worship service where you can come together in the body of Christ and love Him and love one another. Commit to a small group 
where there is a connecting, there is a fellowship between you and a few others who you bond with, but also you're committing yourself to discipleship. You're becoming a disciple. Not necessarily Christian. They were called Christians in Acts. But Jesus has called us to be disciples. That's a follower of Christ. And then I want you to begin to serve. Commit to a team. And we have several teams in our church. Teams that do ministry in-house and teams that do ministry outside the four walls. And I would encourage you to get involved in both avenues. Ministering and loving one another, but also loving the loss in our community. But you see, the growth that takes place in your life affects you beyond just your ministry here. You become outward aimed in your own life through the faith of a, a, because of a growing faith in Jesus. That means when you walk into your work, you're looking at that person who may not know Christ, and your intent and your heart is to see them to know the very God that you serve. That's when you walk in the schools, uh, the doors of your schools, you begin to see those individuals, not as just fellow teenagers, but folks who have a destiny because God has promised them something. And they just have yet to see light over the darkness. And you're the light. When you begin to allow that to well up within your spirit, we begin to live differently. And that's what I'm asking from you today. Three simple steps. Three simple steps that begin to perpetuate these things on our journey. Come to church. Be faithful to the house of God. Number two, be a part of a small group. And number three, join a team. And watch, and watch, love, watch fellowship, watch discipleship, watch ministry, watch, watch evangelism just begin to take place in your heart. And we're praying and believing that the end goal would be that many would come to know Jesus because of your faith. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm asking, let's take this journey together. Inviting others along the way to know Him and to make Him known to know Him and to make Him known.